In part five, we are going to discuss the roles of mindset and exercise on learning. In this Kelvin and Hobbes comic, Kelvin asks Susie what she is doing. Susie explains that she didn't understand the chapter and all the things she was doing to learn the material. Kelvin responds, you do all that work? And Susie says, well, now I understand it. Kelvin's response is, I used to think you were smart. Here is an important question for you to think about. Do you believe your intelligence is fixed or something you could develop? For a little more than 40 years, the research of Carol Dweck, a professor of psychology at Stanford University, has done much to answer this question. Professor Dweck has found that people have one of two mindsets. Either they have a growth mindset, as exhibited by Susie, or they have a fixed mindset, as exhibited by Kelvin. People with a fixed mindset think effort is a bad thing. It means you are not smart or talented. Whereas growth mindset people believe effort is what makes you smart or talented. Professor Dweck's research has shown that for effective learning, differences in native ability are dwarfed by habits and methods. In other words, you can make yourself smarter. Here are some characteristics of the fixed and growth mindsets. The fixed mindset believes your abilities are carved in stone, whereas the growth mindset believes your basic qualities are things you can cultivate through effort. With the fixed mindset, effort means you don't have a skill or talent. With the growth mindset, it is understood that there are differences in initial talent and aptitude, but with effort, everyone can grow. The fixed mindset is concerned with being judged. If you get an A on an exam, it means you are smart. If you get a C on an exam, it means you are average, and since your abilities are fixed, you will remain average. The growth mindset is concerned with improving. If you get a C on an exam, it just means you're going to have to work more to learn the material. So in the fixed mindset, if you fail at something, it means you are not smart. In the growth mindset, if you fail at something, it means you are still learning. The fixed mindset will self-handicap to prevent a poor performance from reflecting on their ability. For instance, they may not register for a course because it's difficult and it would expose that they're not smart. Or they'll stay up partying all night before a test, so now they have a reason why they didn't perform well and it wasn't because they're not smart. For the growth mindset, True potential is unknown. It takes time to flower. It could be years or decades to see what you can achieve with effort. There is ample evidence that you can increase your intelligence. An IQ test is designed so that the average score is a 100. Over the last 50 years, IQ test scores have gone up 15 points. So in other words, if you take an IQ test that is designed for today and get 100 on it, if you took an IQ test from 50 years ago, you would score 115. This is known as the Flynn effect after James Flynn who discovered it. The fixed mindset believes the brain cannot change, but the brain is remarkably plastic. Since the 1990s, Brain researchers have come to realize that the adult brain is far more adaptable than anyone imagined. As you listen to me, your brain is changing. Connections are forming between neurons. In just two hours, magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, has shown changes in the brain from learning. Neurons are born in the hippocampus every day, and in part one we learn the essential role the hippocampus plays in the formation of long-term memories. Dendrites, the branched extensions of nerve cells, grow and sprout. Synapses, the connections between nerve cells, form as you learn. 
new blood vessels can form in the brain as a result of things like exercising. And since, as we talked about in part one, the brain uses 20% of the oxygen and glucose of the body, blood vessels to the brain play an important role in supplying that energy and oxygen to the brain. The first person to observe neurogenesis in an adult mammal brain was Joseph Altman in the 1960s. It was dogma in the 1960s that neurogenesis does not occur in the adult brain. So Altman was ignored, then he was ridiculed. After failing to receive tenure at MIT, he moved to Purdue where he spent the rest of his career on the faculty in the biology department. It was 30 years later that neurogenesis was rediscovered and Altman was proven correct. Let's look at a study that showed changes in measured IQ and a corresponding change in the brain structure. The IQs of adolescents were measured at the start and end of a four-year period. In addition, MRI brain scans were performed at the start and the end of that four-year period. The MRI scans show that those students who had improved their math IQ strengthened the areas of the brain related to math. Similarly, those students who improved their English IQ strengthened the areas of the brain related to English. Let's look at some research that showed a structural change in the brain of London taxi drivers. To get a license to be a taxi driver in London, you have to pass a test referred to as the knowledge, which typically takes four years of study. To pass that test, you need to know an area of six mile radius. London is like no other city. There's no grid and there's 25,000 streets, and those streets are all at different angles. To pass the test, you must know the most efficient route between any two points. The Thames River cuts through London, and sometimes the best route crosses the Thames River twice. You must know the location of every landmark. Before the subjects embarked on the study of the knowledge, Magnetic resonance imaging was done of their brains. Four years later, those who passed the knowledge test showed an increase in the volume of their hippocampi. Here was direct evidence of structural change of the brain with studying. The brain's wiring will change with use. As an extreme example, in blind and deaf people, the brain rewires to use areas normally dedicated to processing sights or sound. A blind person will develop a higher touch sensitivity to read braille by utilizing parts of the brain that are normally used for sight. Now that we have seen that learning can change brain structure, let's look at one of Carol Dweck's experiments on mindset. The mindset of students at Columbia University who were about to take a pre-med chemistry course was determined by asking questions like, do you believe your intelligence is fixed or something you could develop? Those who exhibited a fixed mindset did poorly in the course. They used poor study methods such as rereading of the text and notes and memorizing the material instead of trying to understand the material. Those with the growth mindset earned much better grades. Their study methods were better, too. They looked for themes and underlying principles. They were studying to learn, not to ace an exam. Let's look at another investigation of mindsets. A diverse group of fifth graders were given 10 moderately difficult problems from a nonverbal IQ test. After the test, one group was praised for their intelligence, one group for their effort, and one group received nonspecific praise. Then they all completed a second test of very difficult problems, and they were all told they did a lot worse. 
finally they completed a third test that was similar in difficulty to the first test. When they took the first test, the average number of correct responses was about 5 out of 10. Those who received nonspecific praise again got about 5 of the problems correct. Those who were praised for their intelligence saw a slight decrease in the number of problems they got correct. Those who were praised for their effort saw a significant increase in the number they got correct from 5 to almost 7. Since these problems were from an IQ test, praising ability lowered IQ and praising effort raised IQ. Praising students for intelligence put them in a fixed mindset. Praising students for effort puts them in a growth mindset. The researchers did one final thing. They told the students that these problems were going to be given to students at another school, and they asked the students to write notes to these students about the problems and to indicate their scores. 40% of the ability praise students lied about their scores and always in one direction. So the researchers took ordinary children and turned them into liars simply by telling them they were smart. Let's look at one more investigation of mindset. Entering 7th graders were divided into two groups. The control group had six sessions on study skills. The intervention group had six sessions, but some were on study skills and some on growth mindsets. So the intervention group were told how the brain can grow and how new connections are formed when they are studying and that they can get smarter by working on challenging tasks. Coming out of sixth grade, the math GPAs for the two groups was just over 2.5. The group that was not taught about mindset saw a decrease in their math GPA down to 2.37 at the end of seventh grade. The group that was taught about mindset saw an increase in their math GPA to 2.68 at the end of seventh grade. By putting students in a growth mindset, there was a significant improvement in their math abilities. The movie Groundhog Day is about someone who changes from having a fixed mindset to a growth mindset. Bill Murray plays Phil Connor, a Pittsburgh weatherman sent to a small town to cover the Groundhog Day ceremony. On February 2nd, if a groundhog sees a shadow, there will be another six weeks of winter. If not, there will be an early spring. Phil considers himself superior, has complete contempt for the Groundhog Day ceremony, the town, and the people. He wants to get out of the small town after the ceremony and back to Pittsburgh, but a blizzard prevents his leaving. When he wakes up the next morning, it's Groundhog Day again. This keeps repeating day after day. At first, Phil acts out his fixed mindset, making fools out of other people. Since he is the only one reliving the day, he can talk to someone on one day and then use the information to deceive and impress them the next. He can prove his superiority over and over. He eventually realizes he is going nowhere and doomed to keep repeating Groundhog Day, so he tries to kill himself. He crashes a car, electrocutes himself, jumps from a steeple, walks in front of a truck, but he again wakes up on Groundhog Day. It finally dawns on him to use the time to learn. He takes piano lessons, reads voraciously, learns a foreign language, finds out about people who need help that day and starts to help them and care about them. As he completes his transformation to a growth mindset, he is released from the spell. Let me give you an example to illustrate where a growth mindset can take someone. I'm going to describe someone who wanted to be a writer and accomplished this because of their growth mindset. Okay, this person had earned a C- in high school English. 
his SAT verbal score was 475 out of 800, which put him in the bottom third. He needed five years to graduate high school. He read two to three times slower than the average person, and he had difficulty learning how to spell. This person was John Irving, who went on to write 17 novels. His book, The World According to Garp, won the National Book Award and was made into a movie. He won an Academy Award for his screenplay to his novel, The Cider House Rules. As the John Irving example illustrates, talent and ability are not fixed. They can be developed with deliberate practice. There is no telling what you can accomplish. True potential is unknown and takes time to develop. Your effort is more important than your starting ability. I now want to talk about the importance of exercise to your mental abilities. Back in the beginning of part one, I mentioned how your brain uses 20% of your body's glucose and oxygen. That glucose and oxygen gets to your brain via your circulatory system. Exercise improves your circulatory system and results in angiogenesis in your brain. Exercise also spurs the production of neurotransmitters, facilitates synaptic plasticity, and boosts levels of BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. The hippocampus constantly creates new neurons. BDNF helps them grow. BDNF is often referred to as brain fertilizer. Fit children have hippocampi that are 12% larger than unfit children. Let's look at a study of exercise using sedentary students recruited at the University of Dublin. For five weeks, these students were engaged in strenuous exercise on a stationary bike. MRIs were taken before and after the five weeks looking at the hippocampus of the students. Here are the before and after MRI scans and clearly visible to the human eye is the large increase in the hippocampus with the five weeks of strenuous exercise. The hippocampus is crucial to the learning process. It facilitates formation of long-term memory. Here is another study of the effects of exercise on the brain. 59 cognitively healthy people between the ages of 60 and 79 were split into two groups. One group did aerobic exercises and the other stretching and toning exercises for six months. Brain MRI scans were taken before and after. Those who did the aerobic exercises exhibited more gray and white matter in the frontal and temporal lobes. I will close with some references. The first one is a book that has a discussion of the role of exercise on brain health. The others are research papers into the role of exercise on mental performance and brain structure. In part six, I will discuss self-control, grit, meditation, and nutrition.